And then I was just saying that this is it's quite a long presentation and it's because it's a massive subject area. So I'm hoping that I don't bore people <laughs> with it. But um, you can ask questions at the end and I'm really happy to answer questions because I feel quite passionately that we don't talk about this stuff enough and it's really impactful in people's lives. Um, so getting the information out, I think is quite important. I've borrowed pictures here. I should give them credit from Relate who did a lovely series of images um, of sexuality in sort of different life stages and people who've been through different procedures. And it is, I'm focusing on cancer. Um, and the reason for that is, I suppose, you know, the, the sort of the primary remit that I was trying to fulfill here was thinking about cancer diagnosis, but lots of the themes are incredibly relevant across lots of other um, long term illnesses. So hopefully we'll cover lots of things with this. So my background, I am a GP by training, but I worked, I trained in palliative medicine, so I worked in a hospice for about 10 years and worked with lots of people who were living with cancer usually at end of life with cancer, but lots of people that had quite long prognoses um, and also with other life limiting diagnoses. And I really enjoyed that sort of holistic care. And as, although it sounds like an odd thing to go into, there's quite a lot of parallels between um, doing that sort of work, which is very holistic and dealing with areas that people don't like to talk about very much and going into clinical sexology, which is another area where people sometimes feel quite shy about talking about problems that they're having. And we have to be quite creative and look quite holistically to make the problems improve. So I did a two year psychosex um, diploma training and then did medical training to look at the sort of physical doctory side of what goes on when you get problems with sex. And then because I, in my day job, I was using these skills the most with women as they went through menopause. I then did the British Menopause Society menopause training. So I've got this kind of um, this hat that looks at all these areas. And I work in the whole area. I do a clinic on a Tuesday out of the Wilberforce Centre with women who are going through menopause and with psychosex issues. I also work as a GP in North Yorkshire and I'm involved in a local trauma centre in Ripon um, and also do voluntary work with Maggie's and Maggie's is a charity that um, is involved with patients who are going through cancer and we're doing quite a lot of this work with Maggie's. Maggie's are quite keen to get involved with um, helping women who are going through induced menopause and, and developing problems on the back of it. So what I'm going to try and look at tonight, and I've, as you know, as we said, this is my fourth webinar that I'm doing. So some of it's going to be repeated if you've seen any, any of the others, but I'm assuming that the people that are watching may not have looked at the others. So I'm going to give an overview of what happens with sexual problems and why it involves body and mind and what's happening in your wider life and relationship. I'm going to do it with a focus on long term illnesses, particularly cancer, because cancer, lots of the treatments that we use to help people to recover from cancer or live with cancer one of the side effects of lots of them is that it can cause damage to your sexuality and also cause specific damage to um, the ovaries and the parts of this that are involved in our hormonal cycle so it can induce menopause or the treatments that we give people after cancer to keep their hormones levels low can make you be in an induced menopause. And it's a bit different in that situation than it is for the average woman who's going through a natural menopause because the treatment options that you've got are not as wide sometimes as the ones that are available for everybody else. And one of the things that I hear quite a lot with all the conversation we're having around menopause now is that, well, what do I do if I can't have HRT? So I'm gonna try and make sure that we cover um, some of that this evening as well. And for those of you that haven't come across Maggie's, just a plug for Maggie's because they don't advertise very much, but they offer quite a lot of ongoing support and help for these kinds of problems. And, and I've got some involvement in that too. So why is sex important? I always find people think it's slightly odd that I did training in, in working with sexual function, but actually for most of us, our sexuality is quite an important part of who we are. It's quite an important part of relationships and quality of life. And it's really disturbed by the journey through long-term illness and through cancer. And it may be difficult to sort of expect numbers like this, but actually up to 22% of couples will separate once they've gone through cancer. And it's particularly high, that separation rate, when it's the woman that's had cancer and the man's become the carer. So clearly something impacts relationships in this process. And I think it's, it's quite a predictable, um, difficult period for people to live through. And I think that we should get better at providing patients with the right information and the right pointers to stop them from coming across problems that we might be able to help them with. 
So what do I mean when I'm talking about sex? I think most of us, when we think about sex, think about penetrative sex, but actually the definition is much wider than that. And, and I'm looking at all forms of intimacy. And we know that sexual activity is a marker of health. It's positively correlated with um, health in middle age and beyond. We know that people that have satisfying sex lives have better quality of life scores. And bizarrely, we know that if you have 100 orgasms a year, it seems to give you a three to eight year extension in your life expectancy. So the, the bits of your body that have to be working well for sex are actually the same bits that need to be working well for heart health and general health. So sexual function is quite important for our health and for our well-being. And cancer-induced menopause can cause problems to us because it hits us across all these areas that we look at when we're dealing with um, sexual functions. So we know that your body will change as you go through a cancer journey we know that how you feel in yourself is going to be affected so your psychology is going to be affected and you're going to have a, a wider sort of impact on the environment around you so partners are often impacted by dealing with a cancer diagnosis and somebody that they love children and wider sort of work settings often look very different after you've been through cancer than they did at the beginning so all of these things impact our sense of who we are and impact how we feel within our relationships and our sense of our identity. So how does this sort of thing happen? What happens in our body? I'll talk about it in more detail as we get into um, the rest of the slides that I've got. But going through menopause, marks a massive change in how your body functions. So we've got estrogen receptors all the way through our bodies and they're really concentrated in our genitals. And when we start to lose our estrogen and hormones like testosterone, it significantly changes the way that these parts of us feel, respond to touch, and also whether or not they experience pain if we're penetrated or whether we're able to become aroused and reach climax. We can experience dryness, we can experience um, changes in urinary function, changes in pelvic floor muscle strength. All of these things are gonna affect our sexuality. And when you couple that with the kind of treatments that we give people to treat cancer, like surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, the medications that you might end up on, all of those things can have direct and indirect impacts on the way that the, the nerves, the muscles, the chemicals in our bodies have to work to enable us to have a healthy functioning sex life. So again, I'll give more detail, but this is just an overview at the beginning. In terms of our psychological well-being, well, menopause gives women a hit anyway, actually. It's quite a difficult transition for many women to cope with aging, cope with a change in our role and our identity. We get loads of images of sexiness as being the preserve exclusively of young people. So it can be quite challenging to watch your body age and change. And I think this is really impacted by some of the physical changes that we're put through when we have a long-term illness or when we have cancer. So things like mastectomy, um, scarring on our body changes to the shape and size, skin, hair, all of these things impact how we feel in ourselves and our sense of our sort of sexual identity. And there's something that I hear a lot from patients about a sense of loss of trust or safety within their bodies too. And I think all of these things become really relevant when we're expecting, whether we're able to expect pleasure from our bodies when we've been through something like this. And relationship dynamics change with illness. It, you, we go from sort of being in an adult adult relationship to sometimes a period of having a patient and a carer. Um, and that can be quite a challenge in a relationship, particularly from a sexuality point of view. Sex is often put to one side when going through something that's life threatening, like a cancer diagnosis. And couples can find it really difficult to pick that up again afterwards and to see each other in the same way as they did before or to know how to get back to that kind of dynamic. So I'll talk a little bit about that um, as we go through the presentation. It's also, again, that kind of imagery that we're exposed to. It, it's hard enough thinking about feeling sexually attractive when you become you know, a mother of grown up children or a grandmother. Um, but again, the, the images that we get around what it's like to lose hair as we go through a cancer journey, to change body shape as we go through a cancer journey. All of these things can impact how we feel in ourselves and whether we're able to find ourselves um, or fight, sort of contact our sexual identity. So in short, it, we're hit from all sides with things and that's why I think it's particularly important to give information and advice to help. So looking at what we do specifically and, and how menopause can impact. So first of all, I think, it can feel like there's not many people that are that have gone through what you've gone through, but we know that as we get better, 
at treating cancer that the number of individuals that are living with having had a cancer and survived it is going to go up dramatically. I think the estimate is by 2030 that one in five of us from midlife onwards would have had cancer and survived it. So this is quite a big chunk of menopausal women um, that are going to be in this demographic. And the increase in survivors is actually mainly driven by the number of women that are going to be surviving breast cancer. We do very well at treating breast cancer. Um, and these women are the ones that are often on hormone blockers or who are being told that they're not able to have HRT. Looking across all cancers, problems with sex is the third most um, common problem that people report when they've survived a cancer. So fatigue and loss of physical fitness are the first two, but people report changes in their sex lives as being the third most bothersome and upsetting thing. And it does matter a bit where you have your cancer in terms of whether or not you're likely to end up with problems with induced menopause or with sexuality. It's much more likely if you've had a gynecological, a, a pelvic cancer like a bowel cancer or a breast cancer because the treatments are going to be directed in, in these sort of parts of us that are quite important for sexual function. But overall across all cancers, about half to two thirds of individuals can expect to have some impact on their sexual function when they've had cancer. And what makes me cross is that we talk to about two thirds of men before they start their treatment about the fact that they may have impacts on their sexual function. But the stats show that we only we talk to less than a third of women because we just don't seem to understand that it's just as important and just as valuable to women to have functioning healthy sexuality as it is for men. So it's one of the reasons why I like talking about it. So why does cancer, why does menopause and cancer and other long-term illnesses impact sex so much? Well, the way that I was taught is that your sexual function sits on top of four kind of basic pillars that, that help us to have healthy sex. And one of those is the parts of our body that are designed to be involved in sex, so sexual function, anything that impacts the way that we can feel desire, arousal and climax is going to get in the way of our sexual function. Sexual body is the idea that you use all of your body in sexual function. You've got to be able to touch, to have saliva, to kiss. You've got to have erogenous zones that are responsive, joints that are not restricted and can move. So our wider physicality has a big impact on our ability to have sex. And again, if you think about cancer, long-term illnesses, it can leave us with restrictions in flexibility. It can dry saliva. It can have impacts in lots of other ways. Sexual identity, as I've touched on, is that concept of yourself as a sexual being, your kind of your the things that turn you on, the things that you enjoy, all of that can be shifted when you go through a life threatening illness and sexual relationship. And so because cancer, long term illnesses, menopause impact all these four areas, they will impact our sexuality really heavily. And when I'm talking about sex, I'm not just talking about sex with a partner. I find that the individuals that get massively forgotten um, in terms of having any conversation with a healthcare provider about this kind of stuff are those that aren't currently in a relationship. It's as if that, you know, if we don't have a partner, that sexuality is just not something that we need to talk to somebody about. But just to recognize that for most of us, sexuality has more than one component. There's the partnered part of what we do, and then there's a the solo part of what we do. And it's quite normal to have to find that that's important to still have that sort of sexual interest or solo sexuality, as well as to have a functioning partnered sex life. And partnered sex is more complicated because it's not just your health and your sexual function that's important. Your partner's sexual function starts to count as well. And many of us, as we get older, our partners are starting to accumulate problems with their own health that can make making sex work between two of you even more complicated. Somebody um, described, I think it was Karen Gurney, described that partnered sex is a little bit like two musicians playing their own musical instruments and trying to harmonize and I think it's quite a nice description because you've got to there's a whole other element of performance anxiety when you've got to sort of time your arousal with a partner's arousal there's that whole you know if you've got difficulty becoming lubricated and your partner has difficulty maintaining an erection it can become incredibly complicated to end up with a good enough experience that is pleasing for both of you and where there is some discrepancy in how much one of you wants sex versus the other, or where there's pain with penetration, partner sex can really suffer. 
So there are direct impacts from the cancer process. There are impacts on your sort of identity and body image, but there are really direct things that happen to us that change the way that our body works. So first and foremost, induce menopause. If we remove ovaries, if we do damage to the pelvis with radiotherapy, which can stop the ovaries from working, or if we prescribe things like letrozole, tamoxifen, zolodex, the drugs that block hormones um, after we've gone through cancer because the, the tumours have been hormone responsive and we need to make sure that the body has very low hormone levels, then that will plunge you into a very abrupt menopause. And that can be felt much more acutely than the natural menopause, which tends to sort of taper down more slowly. Women who've gone through an induced menopause tend to feel their symptoms you know, really abruptly, really severely. We cause specific additional problems due to some of the knock-on effects of surgery. So if you do surgery in somebody's pelvis, you damage the blood supply, you can impact the nerve supply. Um, so function, things like continence can be impacted and that can very much make us feel less confident dur during sexuality. Radiotherapy causes damage to tissues, so it can cause scarring, it can shorten the vagina. Women are often given things like um, vaginal dilators when they've had radiotherapy, um, but in my experience, less often given sort of more wide advice about sexual pleasure and sexuality. Tissues can feel different. Chemotherapy can damage nerves on a permanent basis. It can change the distribution and the type of body hair that we have, change our taste and smell. And many of the medications that we give people routinely to deal with some of the after effects or problems with long term illnesses like antidepressants, painkillers, nerve pain killing drugs, they directly suppress some of the sexual function can make it harder to feel desire, make it harder to have um, a climax. And in my experience, nobody talks to patients about this. I wasn't taught about this until I went and did my sexology um, training and I worked in a hospice for 10 years talking in depth with patients about all of the things that happened when they had cancer and I didn't once talk about sexuality it just wasn't on the page so I think one of the most important things that we need to do as health professionals is normalize the conversation about this because it is so prevalent in so many patients and it distresses people so if we split ourselves into that sort of you know, the first section being the physical impacts of cancer long-term illnesses and menopause the second section being more about some of the psychological impacts hopefully I can cover the things that happen and some of the things that you can do to try and improve um, your experience of things so menopause anyway whether it's caused by cancer or not is difficult for most people in some way or other so there's a whole other you know webinar that I did on the physical changes and there'll be other ones that are available I'm sure on on the menopausal channel but it changes how your brain works it changes whether we're able to sleep it impacts our ability to remember words word finding our mood whether we feel emotional what our confidence is like and most people going through menopause will report some kind of change in libido anyway that's without all the other complications of having cancer or long-term illness it changes your body because you'll get flushes, you'll feel palpitations, your joints can become much more achy, and it has profound effects on the genitals and the pelvic organs, which I'll go into a bit more detail on the next couple of slides. HRT gives a wonderful solution to most of this, but if you're not able to have HRT, and for those people that have had a hormone sensitive tumour, most of the time HRT is way down the list of options if it's there at all, it can feel incredibly isolating not to be included in the conversation about what we can do about it. And women's bodies in their fertile years are really in cleverly adapted to cope with sexuality. And I think if you understand this, it makes it much easier to understand why we have such problems when we remove those hormones afterwards. So the vagina is this sort of, it's, it's easy to describe it as something like a self-cleaning oven in the sense that it constantly turns over its cell walls. So any little damage or um, friction or tears that you might get from penetration or sexual activity, they're very, very quickly healed up. There's a new surface on the inside of the vagina every four hours or so. There's little pleats and folds in the walls, which allow us to have stretch and flexibility in there, get great blood flow, so we lubricate really easily. We have um, a high proportion of glycogen in the cells, which means that lactobacilli li love living there. And we have loads of these bacteria, which is really healthy because they produce an acid called lactic acid, 
which keeps the pH in the vagina low and means that we effectively stop bugs from overgrowing. We, we resist infection really easily despite having sex. And we get reflex erections at nighttime, just like men do, but women are never aware of it. But during your fertile years, at night, three, four times a night, the clitoris will flood with blood, flushing it out, keeping it nice and healthy, and it allows it to stay responsive and allows us to feel pleasure. And the clitoris is a really, I've got a picture on here that we don't necessarily need to have, but just for, for information, the clitoris is much bigger than most people think it is. This is the top bit that everybody kind of recognises as the clitoris, but actually it extends much be, more deeply into the um, vagina and sort of wraps itself around. This is the vagina in the middle here. That's the urethra, the tube that you pee through. And you have these great big bulbs to either side. So this whole organ is vital for sexual pleasure. And as we go through men menopause and we lose blood supply to it and we lose our reflex erections and we lose that kind of pelvic blood flow made much worse when you've had pelvic surgery, for example, then it starts to struggle to stay as responsive and work as well. So we get these fluctuations in estrogen levels and then after menopause or when the um, ovaries are removed, we get this permanent low level of estrogen in the body. Those who are on tamoxifen or letrozole, they're on drugs that are mopping up every last little bit of estrogen that you might be making from other body tissues. We also lose testosterone. We lose it naturally over time as we go through menopause, but again, catastrophically if you have your ovaries damaged or removed. And lots of our sexual response pathways, the kind of the brain bit of us, um, that has interest in sex or might have sexy thoughts or sexy dreams that is really impacted by estrogen and testosterone so when you don't have that you can find that it's quite difficult to have those spontaneous thoughts but it also keeps the tissues and the nerves and the blood vessels to the whole pelvis um, working properly so when we're low in these hormones it's just like driving with the handbrake on it's harder for sexual arousal to work and the low blood supply and the low hormones leads to some of the problems that people who are watching this might be experiencing and may not have realized are to do with um, the menopausal change that's been induced. So women often experience itching, dryness, little tears and fissures in the vulval skin because it thins, it thins by about two thirds actually. If you look at it under a microscope, you don't have this lovely thick sort of layer of healthy cells that can slough off and cope with penetration. It becomes very, very thin um, and it doesn't have that sort of pleats or that bend and stretch anymore. So penetration can become uncomfortable. Sex can become really painful. You can get adhesions, bit that sort of stick together so the clitoral hood can stick to the clitoris and that can cause pain. Um, we can get changes in the skin that can become very irritating or give us intense itch. The bladder is also impacted and full of estrogen receptors. And when we lose estrogen, the tissues there thin significantly too. So bladder problems become more, more of an issue for people. Continence can become more of a problem leaking or needing to go to the bathroom more frequently massive crossover between people who experience bladder problems and sexual problems and people don't often raise it with us um, and your pelvic floor can become weak so these are things if you know about it we can do something about it but because nobody tends to warn women about it i often see them five six years down the track when they've been struggling and not knowing that something can be done you often get more urinary tract infections, particularly if you bother to have sex, you may find that you get a UTI afterwards every time, but just generally you've lost some of that ability to resist infection um, and that can become a, a more problematic issue for lots of women. And sensation becomes reduced. So I get women who tell me that the clitoris feels like it's shrunk or that, you know, that touch is just, you could be touching my shoulder, it doesn't make a difference, that it doesn't feel like it's sensitive anymore. Um, and this, again, is due to those changes, the loss of hormones and the loss of blood supply. So most, most commonly reported um, symptoms in women who are suffering with this, so low desire affects about half of women, loss of lubrication about a third, and dyspareunia is the medical word for painful sex, that's up to half of women. Other things that are going on with health can also impact sex as well. So more wide issues like recurrent thrush, bacterial vaginitis, vaginosis, sorry, um, people who have pelvic pain syndrome, people that are on medications, other neurological health conditions like MS and diabetes, mental health, health problems in the partner, all of these physical things can impact on the quality of our sex life. So what do we do? 
So I'm going to spend the next few slides talking about some of the simple things that we can do that can help to change some of these physical impacts of um, of the menopause and that might have been sort of started by cancer treatments or long term illness treatments. So we need to take steps to support the vulval, vaginal and pelvic health. We need to support your general menopause symptoms, look after you as a whole. I find lots of people who've gone through cancer feel like the only thing that anyone's bothered about is their breast cancer or forever after. It's all about that kind of issue and the rest of their health can be a little bit neglected. So it's really important to look at you as a whole optimize your partner health make sure the medications that you're taking aren't making sex more difficult for you and then look at all of the wider lifestyle choices that might help to support healthy sexuality as well so the first and the biggest message that i'm probably going to give anyone tonight is about looking after firstly about the fact that the vulval vaginal pelvic and bladder health is so vulnerable when you go through menopause but also the fact that that you need to get a whole sort of regime of looking after it going and that many more of you than may realize it are able to have access to estrogens vaginally even when you've had a hormone responsive tumor they're normally safe so i talk to women about the idea that we should get into a routine of washing and checking and moisturizing the vulva and the vagina on a, on a daily basis and then that they should use lubricants and that they should use estrogen. So starting with the sort of the washing. Um, so you don't want to use bubbling things. Anything that's got sodium laureth sulfate in it and bubbles is going to dry out this delicate tissue much more. So I recommend that you get either a plain emollient, something that you might use on eczema, um, or I think what's often nicest is to use something like coconut oil, just plain old coconut oil that you can buy from the supermarket. It smells nice, it's edible, it's something that you can keep in the bathroom without feeling embarrassed about it. And just get a glob of it when you go into the shower, use it to wash, it will dissolve dirt and grease and sweat and, and help to wash it away but it will also trap moisture. And you can use a small amount of it after you've washed to moisturize the vulval tissue, to moisturize around the entrance to the vagina, which helps to keep it a bit more supple. And also when you're doing that, you can get into the habit of checking for any areas that feel different, so that might have become thickened or ulcerated because the tissue is more vulnerable after menopause and more prone to changes that can in themselves become precancerous or problematic. So any areas that seem different, you need to keep an eye on and you should get checked out. You can use vaginal moisturizers, specific vaginal moisturizers like Yes and Silk two or three times a week. And there's good evidence that massage and even using things like a gentle vibrator can improve tissue quality. If we can bring blood supply into the tissues and massage does that and gentle vibrator use does that, it helps to keep the tissues well oxygenated and helps them to regenerate and stay healthy. So you can do this how you, however you wish. Um, but the idea that getting into a regime of washing and moisturizing and massaging is going to keep that tissue healthier. And I see women that you know, can't tolerate wearing jeans because the seam is so uncomfortable or who can split with touch if they don't look after the skin. So it's a really important message. And adding hormones back is something that you should take an active decision on whether you're happy to do so. So almost everybody, um, unless you have an active cancer at that time, is safe to have low dose vaginal estrogens. And if you take these estrogens all year in the dose that they're prescribed, the amount that you absorb internally is the equivalent to taking a single one milligram oral um, tablet of HRT per year. So the amount that you take on board is, is minute. And there's loads of evidence to back up the fact that this is not associated with any increased risk in developing a recurrence of your cancer particularly if you're taking something like tamoxifen because that is blocking breast tissue it's keeping that area safe um, so there is guidance and I'll, I'll point out the guidance shortly that helps to back up and support and to say that it is safe for most women to use these and it's something to think very seriously about introducing because it can make an enormous difference to sexual function but also to vaginal health and just avoiding prolapse and avoiding urine infections and not being up all night itching because it's uncomfortable 
If you're having sex, we normally suggest using more than one lubricant and not all lubricants are created equally. So some of them will dry you out more or will cause more irritation. So I specifically recommend the Yes um, lubricants to most of my patients. And we use something called Double Glide. So this is the idea that the oil-based lube is used on you and you use it inside the vagina and the water-based lube is used on your partner. So whether it's on fingers, a toy, penis, whatever it is that might be penetrating, the water-based lube goes on that, the oil-based is on you and the two together will stay slippery for much longer and can make a massive, massive difference in how comfortable sex feels. So it's a good sort of tip to do that. So I've just got caught on the side there. It's really helpful to pee after sex to flush out that bit of you and that will prevent getting infections you're always getting utis after sex you can talk to your doctor about having a prophylactic antibiotic just taking one after intercourse can really help and some women use a supplement called d manos which helps the bacteria not to stick um, on the cell walls inside the the bladder and it can help to reduce the frequency of infections Getting into good habits with pelvic floor health is useful for all of us, but particularly useful postmenopausally. Um, doing pelvic floor exercises properly is different from doing them badly, but learning how to do one sort of from the bottom, you sort of start at your bottom and you have to almost zip up towards your tummy button and doing fast and short squeezes will help you with blood supply to the area, help to prevent prolapse, help with the strength of your orgasm. One of the reasons that orgasms can become not very good postmenopausally is that the muscles that give us the orgasm become weak and it will help you with your continence. The low school hormones I've, I've talked about already, I've just sort of given a bit more detail on this slide, which I can probably skip past because I said that to you already. They are lifelong. If you start them, it's really important to um, continue them. If you stop them, then within six weeks, the tissues will return to baseline. So the nice guidance on these is that they can be used for as long as needed, even if that's lifelong. They are safe to use with tamoxifen. We can even use them with letrozole, even though that feels that's quite a new instruction but it's this consensus this british society of sexual medicine consensus on gsm which is genitourinary syndrome of menopause is the key document to take to your doctor to discuss and one of the key things that you want to do is not just use it inside the vagina also use estrogen cream on the outside too if you don't look after the skin on the outside and over the labia and over the clitoris then your sexual function is going to suffer so you can use it in both places and again that's a bit different to the standard treatment um, and it's something that you may need to ask about and the bssm consensus will, will help to support you in getting that the types of local hormones, I've covered this in detail in the physical um, webinar that I did, but just to say there's lots of them. The lowest dose one is IM Vagis or Invagis, um, which the numbers are misleading because um, estriol and estradiol are different strengths of um, estrogens, but using a 30 microgram estriol um, pessary on a regular basis is really low dose and it can make a huge difference to comfort. The other one that's really good is the S-string, which is like a little bendy um, curtain ring sized plastic device that you pop inside and the blood levels don't show any increase in estrogen at all when women are using that. So they, these two are really good options for women who are very scared of estrogen after cancer. And um, we have good safety data that it doesn't increase recurrence. And vaginismus is just worth a comment, really, because women who've experienced painful sex will often develop an involuntary spasm of their pelvic floor muscles, which will then get you into a vicious cycle where the expectation that sex might be painful makes you hold a bit more tension in your pelvic floor. And then when the pain recurs, it sort of imprints and the anxiety that that help makes you sort of develop around sex squashes arousal right down means that you lubricate even less well than you would have done before and it starts to become a vicious cycle and I often say to women with vaginismus you know if every time I handed you you know a galaxy chocolate in one hand I hit you on the head with a hammer in the other you soon start to do anticipatory things and wince when I come near you and if you've become and so many women don't want to complain to their partners that sex is painful don't want to stop their partner from their enjoyment so we we consensually will tolerate uncomfortable sex and we can get into this vicious cycle where actually sex becomes incredibly painful and this this pelvic floor muscle spasm which is involuntary can become so solid that it can feel almost impossible to have penetration at all so if that sounds familiar 
whilst we're trying to get the vagina and the vulva to be in healthier estrogenized condition with the things that I've just spoken about, it can be really important to seek a referral to a gynae physiotherapist um, and maybe to do some work with someone like a psychosexual trained doctor or counsellor who can help you to use things like vaginal dilators and gently work on muscle memory and building a new positive cycle that means that you can tolerate that sort of penetration. I've got some pictures here of some of the aids that I use with people in clinic and all of these things are available to buy. Um, so these are Inspire dilators. The NHS dilators that are used to open up the vagina are hideous. They're straight and have really thick ends and are incredibly daunting and they're very plasticky. These are about 50 or 60 pounds to buy, but they can be a game changer. They start with a really small one that you can't see, um, but they're curved to the shape of the body. They're tapered and they've got a little ring at the bottom that you can stick a bullet vibrator into. And working with something like that can mean it's much easier to get that vaginismus to go away and to help to dilate a tightened or um, radiotherapy affected vagina. So if you use better dilators, you often get a sort of better outcomes. These are called O-nuts and they're stacking little rings that you can use on the base of anything that's, I always say anything that's penetrating because I'm aware that I'm not always talking to a heterosexual audience. Um, so you can stack them on the base of the partner's penis or on a toy and it just means that penetration is limited in depth. So if you've had surgery or radiotherapy that's given you some scarring in the vagina and you haven't got that same sort of depth, an O-nut can be a game changer because it allows both partners to have better sensation but without the fear that that penetration is going to be too deep and there are things that can intensify sensations so this is a clitoral sucker everyone knows what a vibrator is that clitoral suckers can be really helpful they sit over the clitoral tissue and they sort of suck air back so it's sort of it's hard to describe it but it helps to sort of get the clitoris to um, increase in size a bit and it's not like vibration which can be almost numbing and make it very difficult to climax sometimes clitoral suckers can be much more helpful when sensation's been really numbed you can buy all of these things everywhere these days um, but they can make a big difference so general menopause treatment so there's there's the sort of the supplements and herbs there's the non-hormonal medications and then there's HRT and I'm mentioning HRT just because the evidence is often a bit different than people are aware of and sometimes it's more possible than you might think and there's also something called CBT for menopause which I've been trained in. Um, so of all this, the dietary supplements and herb options that you've got this is all the sort of list that the British Menopause Society has an opinion on and of all of these top ones, there's very limited evidence for them. So I sometimes talk about melatonin for sleep with um, women because although we don't, we prescribe it in a very limited way in the UK, it is possible to buy online. There is evidence that it helps with sleep quality. It's a natural hormone that we make in the late part of the evening that tells your body that it's nearly bedtime and it can help to induce better sleep. Um, but in the UK, we can only prescribe it to women over to women and men over 55 for three months. But in places like Europe and the in the States, it's available over the counter. So you can access it if you need it. There's not a lot of evidence for ginseng, you know, ginkgo biloba, sage, wild yam. You need to be a bit careful with drugs like St. John's wort because they can interact with some of the other medications that you might be using. But black cohosh and phytoestrogens, we have got an evidence base to say that they work. What we don't have is much data about whether they're safe in people that have had a hormone responsive cancer. So generally speaking, I tend to be quite cautious about those in the same way as I might be cautious about using you know, um, systemic HRT. Black cohosh um, is perhaps a little bit more useful, but you have to be very careful about where you buy it from um, because there's some reports that if it's not a pure form, it can cause liver problems. So it's not an easy landscape to negotiate when you're buying on your own. And that's half the problem with um, buying supplements is it's not a very regulated environment, unlike drugs and medications. The things that we prescribe for people who can't have HRT are, are broadly listed here. 
um, gabapentin many of you will have heard of because we use it for nerve pain and that can reduce hot flushes in about two thirds of women and it can help with sleep and improve anxiety. Um, oxybutynin is a drug that we use for bladder frequency normally but it interferes with how we sweat and it can be really helpful again in two thirds of women that are experiencing hot flushes. It's probably the one that I use the most because most of the women that I see who are having hot flushes are also experiencing some urinary problems and it's well tolerated so I often use that in patients. Venlafaxine and paroxetine are both sorts of um, antidepressant medications, they work slightly differently. Paroxetine isn't safe with tamoxifen um, so I usually focus on venlafaxine in patients that can't have HRT and again about two-thirds of people will get some benefit on flushes, it might help with joint pains, it can help with anxiety, can help with sleep, can be a bit of a downer on sexual function though. Antidepressants can suppress sexuality and make arousal difficult, make climax more difficult. So we've got to sort of balance the pros and cons of that. And clonidine I hardly use. It's the only one that's got a license. It's a blood pressure medication, but I find that it's just so poorly tolerated by patients um, that it's not one that I usually suggest, but it is the only one that's got a license for treating hot flushes. CBT is something that is not very available at the moment, but I'm looking at ways that we might be able to change that potentially in, in the area that you guys are living in. So this is the idea. And when I first heard about CBT for menopause, I thought that's a bit ridiculous. How can you just tell people that it's not so bad and then they get better? But actually it is the idea that most of the pathways that we have that give us the hot flushes and give us the palpitations are very impacted by stress. They're the same final common pathways um, that we use for things like our fight flight reflex is the same one that we use for hot flushes. So anything that we can do that makes you feel calmer and more in control when you get menopausal symptoms will decrease your symptoms. And it's particularly, I think, relevant for patients that have been through the trauma, the medical trauma of going through cancer or a life threatening illness. So these sort of tips and techniques can be really helpful for patients um, in this situation. So what it does is it gives you, so it's a form of talking therapy in a group. So it puts you in a group environment. It gives you lots of skills and information about what's happening, which can help to increase your confidence and take some of the stigma and shame and distress away from the symptoms. It gives you a physiological, an understanding of the physiological basis for what's happening. And it gives you tips and techniques to try and minimize the impact. So breathing techniques, um, sleep hygiene techniques, ways of improving sleep and vasomotor symptoms and it's got good evidence and it's a really useful way of helping to equip you with things that you can do. The other thing that can sometimes help as well is um, acupuncture, auricular acupuncture. Maggie's offers that for hot flushes and it can be really helpful. So HRT sort of patches and, and gels and things, those women who have been through a non-hormone responsive cancer have got HRT on the menu and it's something that can be discussed um, with those patients including those with breast cancer if they had a negative hormone tumor then they're the kind of people that I talk about HRT with in the clinic at the Wilberforce Centre. The, there's just been a big systematic review um, in the Cancer Journal looking at all of the studies that have been done on what happens if we give HRT to women who've had breast cancer and whether it increases the risk of recurrence and kind of instinctively because we give people tamoxifen and letrozole and we squash down estrogen we've all got this impression that you know obviously giving HRT must cause an increase in recurrence of breast cancer but the studies are quite conflicting of 25 studies that were done looking at this particular issue only one of those studies showed an increased risk of recurrence of the cancer in women who are on HRT and the cancer recurrence was in the local area. It wasn't distance recur distant recurrence. So one of the criticisms of that paper is that perhaps those women, they weren't screened before they started their HRT. So the figures may have been skewed by people whose original cancer hadn't been adequately treated. So I think it's a space that might be changing. Opinion might be changing um, as we start to look into this in a bit more detail. And there is a difference between suppressing the cancer that you've had so that it doesn't come back um, and the way that HRT affects your risk of another cancer going forward and they're two different things and the further you get from your original diagnosis the less likely it is that there are existing cells that didn't get treated when you had your um, your breast cancer treatment or your you know your hormone responsive cancer treatment 
and it becomes a little bit more likely to think about HRT further on. So it certainly isn't a standard thing to talk about, but there are patients whose quality of life is so badly affected by hormone loss um, that they want to have a conversation around it. And it is something that can be more nuanced than you might imagine. It's a conversation that is worth having sometimes with a specialist. Testosterone gets talked about a lot in terms of sexuality and HRT, and it's a hormone that women make about three or four times the amount of than um, estrogen during their fertile years. And it reduces as you go through menopause. And if you have your ovaries damaged or removed, it sort of catastrophically falls out. It's very important in sexual function, but it's not the be all and end all. If we're going to treat with testosterone, we have to be treating with estrogen too. So for those that can't have estrogen, they can't have testosterone. Um, but if you are able to have HRT from a sexual function point of view, testosterone replacement is worth trying. So wider health issues, it's important to keep you as a whole as healthy as we can do. Fatigue is a killer for sex. People who are tired, cancer diagnosis or not, are not interested in sex particularly. So treating your pain adequately so you can sleep well is really important. Looking for other causes of fatigue like anemia, thyroid dysfunction is really important. Optimizing weight and heart health and diabetes and thyroid and so on all of these things impact your general state of wellness and therefore will impact sexuality. So it's important to be really kind of holistic in what we're doing and treating simple things. Loads of the medications that we use give a dry mouth. Dry mouth means that kissing is difficult, oral sex is difficult. Sometimes it's worth using saliva sprays that can be prescribed or bought over the counter and simple things can make a big difference um, to your experience of your body. Partner health is one of the biggest things that impacts female sexual satisfaction scores. So again, just making sure that we treat partner health, we're treating two people within a sexual relationship rather than just one. Um, and making sure that we, I'll talk a bit about these bits a bit later on, these sort of desire discrepancy and communication around sex, but giving an opportunity for partners who are suffering with things like erectile problems um, or female partners that are also suffering with other sort of, you know, vaginal dryness and so on, that we're treating both sides of the equation rather than just the person who's sat in front of us. And looking through your list of drugs and seeing if it's got any of these things on it. So doctors are not always warned about the sexual impacts of the medications that we prescribe and, and loads of things that we prescribe can cause problems. So if you're on any of these things, so blood pressure drugs, um, codeine or morphine based painkillers, antidepressants, antihistamines, anticholinergics are things that are usually prescribed for IBS, um, anything that impacts hormone levels, it's quite likely that they're impacting your sexuality and it might be that there's a switch to something else that might make a big difference to you. Lifestyle choices, I mean the, the, the general rule around lifestyle and menopause is that if you can do something that reduces stress and improves general well-being, then it's really likely that it's going to have a positive impact on hot flushes and anxiety and sleep and help you to manage your menopause better. So there's evidence for things like yoga, um, for acupuncture, auricular acupuncture, cold water swimming. Um, but really, it's about finding something that you enjoy and that gives you joy. And I think if you can do it like that, then you'll end up feeling much better in yourself. And that in itself has a knock on effect on sexuality, because if you feel um, happy with how your body moves and what it does, it improves how you feel in yourself and it can make you feel um, more sexually interested. So I'm aware of how much I'm trying to cram in and time and things I'm going to rattle through slightly on this second section. So this is more about the psychological, psychosexual stuff that I talk about with people um, in terms of their sexual identity and their impacts on sexual relationships. And there's no one size fits all with this stuff. And we did two other webinars focusing in detail on each section. But I think from a cancer perspective, what you need to recognize and validate really is that it's a trauma. Um, being told that you've got a life-threatening illness or a life-limiting illness is a traumatic um, impact and, and you will have a response to that. There's a, there's a grieving process that goes with that. There's a whole sort of shift in identity and I've had patients describe it as it's like seeing behind the magic curtain. You have that sort of sense of invulnerability that we have at one point in our life goes away 
and that can be massive for some people for some people it can become a real source of um zest for life actually and it can and, and there are reports of people whose sexuality actually sort of goes upwards with it because it can make them feel alive and connected but for lots of women and for men there's a loss of that sort of casual sense of trust and safety within your body and one of the ways of coping with difficult and painful and unpleasant treatments and procedures is to dissociate a bit from your body. So when something, you know, if someone takes blood, most of us look away because we're trying not to think and be attached to the bit that's going to feel pain. And going through painful treatments teaches you on a regular basis to kind of step out of your body as a, a way of coping. And to have good sex, you've got to do the opposite. You've got to be really in your body and able to feel sensation and to sort of be you know, safe and comfortable and trusting in your body. So sometimes it can be incredibly hard having learned to step out, to do the opposite and kind of step back in again. And we can do psychosexual work around that to help you to not be distracted during sex, to kind of come, come back into yourself. It's sometimes helpful to directly have counselling, to 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 sort of acknowledge the massive impact of this we have we have language around cancer in this country about surviving and fighting and you know really sort of strong language that is not always matched brilliantly to what it feels like to go through the experience so i think being aware that it's incredibly normal to be blindsided by a diagnosis like this and to not recognize the new you um, compared to the person you were beforehand and to validate that by doing some counselling, maybe considering doing some trauma work, um, maybe having some talking therapy. We can practice mindfulness, and I talk about that more on the um, one of the previous webinars, but this idea that we need to focus in on sensory input, and we actually have to practice that. If we want to get back to sex, we've got to practice noticing pleasure all the time in everything that we do during the day. So that might be you're going for a walk and connecting in with what you can see, smell, hear. It might be doing something simple like having a drink or, or um, eating something, but paying deliberate attention um, to the sensory input from that as a way of almost switching your body on and switching on your ability to notice and enjoy pleasure for pleasure's sake. From a psychosexual point of view, I often work with women on self-focus, so sort of reconnecting with their body and almost remapping their body, not just genitally, but starting, you know, with, with hands and hair and shoulders and feet, um, with touch and learning how your body feels, what is pleasurable, what's indifferent, what's bad, what kind of touch you like now with a curiosity rather than with a goal focus, not because you want to have an orgasm or to see whether you still can, but this idea of pleasure for pleasure's sake, of taking time and touching in a way that is um, just pleasurable and enjoyable and that being worthwhile, starting like that on your own can be a really important thing to kind of reawaken a side of you that may have been sort of pushed onto a shelf for a long period. And there are books and there are, you know, there are resources that can help you to sort of map out a bit more where you are in your erotic identity now, because again, you know, you spent a period being a patient, you've got to readjust into a new body image. Sometimes it shifts things that you like and don't like, and you feel okay with and don't feel okay with. So paying deliberate attention to where you are now and giving yourself permission to read and look and to discover, and I've given some books on here that, that I think are quite useful. Um, it helps you to start with you. What, what's the context that you need to be in the right place for this? What are the things that stop it being something that you can access? What, what can you do with that? And within your relationship, I think it's important to understand that a relationship is, you know, it's a balance between two people. And if one side shifts, the whole relationship shifts. So you feeling that you're a new person potentially after going through this and your partner probably having had a very similar shift in how they feel means that the relationship between you is new and there's an element of having to mourn actually what's lost and what's changed and find a way of accepting that and then become curious and develop a new relationship between the two of you and what i find with um, couples is that where sex has become a problem and one partner might be interested in the other has got a reason to want to avoid it it becomes the elephant in the room and anything any intimacy any cuddle anything there's a fear that it might be seen as a green light so often all intimacy gets lost people don't go to bed at the same time they don't want to sit on the, on the sofa close together for fear that the partner might think it's okay to have a go so sometimes it's really useful just to um 
to, to talk about it, to find a way to communicate about a wish to get intimacy back, but to negotiate things that are okay to do at the moment and things that aren't. So when I start with patients, I sometimes say to them, look, look tell your partner that you've been to see me today, tell them that we're going to start down a route of some physical treatments that might improve um, bits of our bodies that are involved in sex. And that actually we're going to try and work on intimacy and you're going to work on self-focus, but penetrative sex is not going to happen for a bit. And we're just going to agree that, that any intimacy that happens is not going to end up there. Because by agreeing that that's not where all touch has to end, it can sometimes free people up to be much more curious and open to some touch for the sake of enjoying any touch, rather than feeling like if I accept a shoulder massage, I know that the next thing that I'm going to get is this. And it helps you to connect and, and bond again sometimes. The other thing I just put on the bottom here is it can be really worth reading. Um, Esther Perel's brilliant as a relationship therapist. She talks a lot about how difficult it can be to have warm love, companionate, caring love for somebody that you adore and to be able to eroticize them at the same time and find them sexy. And having been through a carer relationship and being in that sort of position of vulnerability, often people find it hard to get back into that sexual space. Um, so some of her work is really useful in ways of doing that within a relationship. And this slide is really just to say from the partner perspective, we all have different ways of showing our, our love to each other. And there's this theory that there's five different love languages. And for some people, touch is their main love language. And when sex has become affected within a relationship, if we don't communicate why that's gone away, then it can be received by the other partner as if um, all affection has been withdrawn. It can feel like, but like love is being rejected rather than just sexuality. So I think one of the things that's most important when sex has become an issue after something like cancer or, or menopause is opening up lines of communication, widening the definition of what intimacy counts. So maybe agreeing that penetration is not on the, on the table for a period, but actually other forms of intimacy are okay. And this concept of making sex a buffet rather than a three course meal, you know, there's loads of things that count as, as sexual or intimate touch or pleasurable touch. Most long-term relationships, you know, A leads to B leads to C and that's what sex looks like. But the idea that you can have a bit of A and that's it, where you can go in at sort of F or Z and all of it counts, um, can allow you to develop good enough sexuality. It may not look like it did before, but it, it will still bring back that warmth and that intimacy and that sort of erotic space between the two of you that can be really important. And we can do this for psychosex work as well. So we can work on non-sexual touch because that releases chemicals that bond us to our partner it's half the reason why we fall head over heels in love is that when we start touching a new partner we get loads of oxytocin and vasopressin that tells us that we love each other you can actually do that by prolonged hugging prolonged eye contact and sensate focus work so we start with you know touching non-genital areas we work towards chests we move towards genitals eventually we move towards penetrative sex but Taking the goal of orgasm out of it, taking the fact that all, set, all touch must lead to attempt at penetration can be incredibly freeing. And once you start to get back into that space with each other, you get little wins from doing it that help you to feel safer and can rebuild. It, it can rebuild quite naturally from that place, given the chance to do so. The talking about sex can be really difficult, surprisingly difficult with long term partners, actually. Um, so again, I did this in more detail on one of the other webinars, but use I statements. Don't say you never do this. Say I love it when. Massive difference. Choose the right moment. Choose a moment where you're feeling intimate and connected, not when one of you is um, feeling defensive or you've had a conflict. And phrase it nicely. Start by talking about what you miss. You know, I, I miss lying with you after sex. I miss skin on skin. I miss because it's a much more positive way of talking about something that you might want to rebuild give space to talk both of you about what elements of your connection you want to bring back in and how that might happen and try really hard to be non-defensive when you're hearing their responses it can be really difficult um, it can be really shaming scary vulnerable stuff to talk about but if you're able to talk about it you'll do much better only a few more slides i'm mindful it must be near the end um, so this is just about libido. This is just about the big libido myth that libido falls from the sky and it's spontaneous and that all sex is because we just get an urge for it. 
actually only about 15% of women will experience libido in that way anyway. Most women will experience it responsibly. So somebody will touch or say something or remind you of something or you'll get a smell or something will kind of light the flame and then you get desire and then you want to have sex. So I guess the main point of this is libido can be squashed by hormones being squashed. Those of us that feel spontaneous desire will feel less of it without estrogen and testosterone, but you can work on it. You can work on being willing and you can work on, um, I suppose, that openness to creating situations where some of that touch may happen. And again, that's kind of how sensate focus works, that when you get a, you know, a lovely massage or somebody touches your breast and it feels pleasurable, um, and again, touch can feel very different after cancer, so we've got to map out and work out what feels pleasurable. But the feeling of pleasure can then be the thing that creates that sort of sense of desire or, or what people think of as horniness that can come after the touch has started if you're waiting to feel that feeling of i'm in the mood before you have a go at touch you may never get off the ground it's a bit like if you love eating at a fantastic restaurant you sometimes have to book it in advance and plan it it's a bit like that with sex especially in long-term relationships and particularly um, when you're challenged because of hormones and everything else that's happened so I've shown this slide at the end of all of the um, webinars that I've done, and it's a bit of a mishmash, but it's the idea that if you're trying to get back to sex, I like Karen Gurney's model that there are three sides, like the fire triangle, that triangle, there's three things that give us good sex and you need to work out for you by looking at the sex that you've had previously, which is the best that you've had, where your head had to be for it to be good. So what kind of a day did you need? How do you need to feel about what you're wearing? How do you need to feel about, you know, emotional intimacy and relationship with your partner that day? And what sort of stuff do you need to be doing for it to be a turn on? And how can you sort of explore that side of things? You need to get physical arousal, right? So we need to work out how to make your body feel it's most receptive to touch. What kind of touch do you like best? This is the self-focused mapping stuff. How do I like being touched now? What kind of touch with what, for how long, what pressure? I'm working out that side. And the very bottom is how do I stay mentally present and within my body and not distracted? What things need to be in place for me to connect in with sensation rather than worrying about what my body looks like or worrying about what my partner's thinking? And it's, um, you can sort of look at this probably on the webinar and capture it, but it can be a really good starting point for you to start to figure out what might need to change to get you back into the zone of sexuality being better. And there's a quick slide with options for referrals and books and things that can be helpful. And then I will stop chatting and see if anyone's still awake. <laughs>